live from New York City, it's Wearable Electronics with your hosts and mine, Becky Stern. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Wearables live broadcast here from the Adafruit factory today. I'm joined by the lovely Colin Cunningham. Colin. That was my tooth glinting, actually, but I wasn't smiling. Ding! We need a sound effect. Um, it Got one. It is January 27th. It's true. My favorite part of the month of January. Oh, I love the winter. What is on today's show, Colin? I love the winter. I love the snow. I love the Wednesdays do when they're wearable. Do you love the mountains and do you love the daffodils? Sure. Why not? I love the hills and the valleys. The peaks and the troughs. Today on Wearable Wednesday, we'll be covering a lot of good stuff. We share with you <laughs> projects from the blog, projects that you make, and we debut a new project video. Today it's all about muscle sensing, as promised last week. Sorry for the hair in my microphone. Right. No hair sensing, just muscle sensing. No, just muscle sensing. We'll also stroll by the project workshop. This is where we take a long question from you about a project and give you lots of ideas for how to work through it, make it better. Awesome. Today it's a project from the uh, question from the forums about putting electronics inside a plush toy. Stuffed animal taxidermy was my first guess. And we'll be also looking at our component of the week. This time it's a coming soon, super exciting education board called Circuit Playground. Learn more soon. Whole lot of pack of fun. That's my nickname for it. Circuit Playground is a little catchier. We'll also be answering some cues. Yes, correct. <laughs> you had to double check me on that. I didn't throw an acronym. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, if you have any questions about wearable electronics, you can ask them now in the live chat or later in any of the YouTube comments or on Twitter or on the Adafruit blog or on Google+. Mm -hmm. And I will go around and round them up and answer them on a future show, making you eligible to win the show's giveaway. Today's giveaway is a copy of this book, Getting Started with Adafruit Flora by me and Tyler Cooper. Very good. Excellent. And if you'd like to pick something up from the Adafruit shop, you can use the discount code MILLION to get 10% off anything in the store, excluding gift certificates and software, and that expires at 11.59 p.m. Million. One million discount it's codes. true. Yes, and we're going to find out why that is such a significant number. If you've been paying attention on the Adafruit world, you may already know. It's not just because we like Austin Powers. That's true. Let's write it where in what? Million. One million. We have a, a one, million We what? just had our millionth order on the website. It's true. One million mm -hmm. orders. So thank you everyone who's placed any of those orders. Um, I've heard that our millionth order was for a Gakken mini theremin kit. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that's for a cat to play with. If, if anyone, yeah, because it's the cats, for a cats like to play with. To play with and our, for humans to play yeah, with. That's true. So thanks for a million orders. You can learn more about our previous order number milestones in the one million order blog post on the blog. Mm, many stops along the way. It's a big landmark. Phil made a joke about how we couldn't ship a million orders alone, except maybe Angel could if she had enough coffee. I wouldn't put it past her. She's a machine, a smiling, warm human machine. She's not a machine. She's a human. She's Amazing a human. very fast shipper. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and having mm, relatively nothing to do with that is this, which <laughs> it was hard to say from that. That was just sight news. At first, I thought we were examining the anatomy of an order, and I was surprised to find it was a tube-like. Uh, compound creation. But. It's the internet. It's a series of tubes. Right. Okay. Um, no, so this, this is, is a thing Leslie posted up from uh, Fudan University in Shanghai where they're developing fibers that mimic the electrocytes in eels. So you know how like electric eels act like capacitors and they go zap. Yeah. Well, these scientists are trying to sort of, of you know, use some, some um, na carbon nanotubes and other high tech things to make a capacitor like textile. To zap people you don't want touching you? Well, there is a jacket that does that, but, um, but maybe just to store energy oh, on the body for wearables, right? Um, and so they wrapped sheets of carbon nanotubes around elastic rubber fibers and then patterned the patches to convert them into with conductive and insulating areas like capacitors to um, create a larger capacitor that's a with the goal of making a textile, textile fiber capacitor. Pretty sweet. Yeah. Really neat. Uh, the future is now. Guys. The future is now, and and just a little while ago. And, and material it's science is really exciting and and often overlooked um, engineering field. I would say. Pretty important. Yeah. Speaking of materials. Science, science. Different science, science. Science, science. Bracelet um, silence. This is a NeoPixel bracelet by Brian Ramuno. It has a NeoPixel strip and a random blinking code sketch running on it. Quite nice disco accessory. It is. I prefer this to the classic uh, spike studs. 
The shiny spike studs? Yeah. Although in the club, the shiny spike studs do reflect the lighting from above and so have a similar sort of shiny effect. However, these eh. aren't going to hurt anyone and you could put flexible NeoPixel, or sorry, flexible um, Ninja Flex spikes on top of them. True. I kind of think the, you know, the bare LED aesthetic is kind of works for it. A yeah. real strong, intentional. Yeah, it looks like rivets. Looks like, looks like NeoPixels. Yeah. We've got to take that step back and objectively see our times for what they are. Or not. Your LEDs. Call. Right. Speaking of even more LEDs in unexpected places. Leslie posted about, about this. This is the folks <gasps> from Grindhouse mm -hmm. Wetwear who um, have been experimenting with uh, coatings and charge capabilities of circuits that they are implanting subdermally. Um, this, this is significantly more hardcore than the bracelet. Yeah, orders of magnitude more hardcore for sure. Um, the term grinders refers to people who are part human and part machine, and uh, they're on a mission to augmenting humanity using safe, affordable, open technology and uh, have bigger goals to create an open source heart. However, this is just one step along the way. LEDs on a circuit board uh, with a coating inside that's supposed to be medically safe. Who knows for how long? It's an experiment. Right, and it's that's open source. how they're, they're going to know for how long exactly. Um, there is a video that we did not embed, and I have a hard enough time looking at this photo, but it was very interesting, very not interesting concept. Yeah, yeah, not for the squeamish, but very interesting stuff going on. Uh, people, an increasing number of people willing to try something like this. I would like to move on to the next image, though. Right, I'm just wondering how the thickness of it. I'm going to have to investigate it, There's a, a picture more. of the just circuit itself right. on the blog. Um, it's like a little, it's like a quarter-sized little mm. disc and, and the Not inductive smell. charging or anything. No, there's a, no. No, you have to take it out to change the battery, but the battery okay. will last a really long time. Okay, we're going to uh, move on. We're going to move on. Look we at got the, it. I'm a little bit we're squeamish. Out. It's cool enough to talk about. I just have a I hard time you. looking I at got, the stitches, you've, that's all. You've had to deal with enough. Show it to me when it's when it's healed. Wound things, yes. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, on the brighter side, um, Calvin wrote in to share this, uh, this cheer sign project that he made with the University of Dayton Lady Flyers for the cheer squad. So it's got a flora on the back and a, and a lithium polymer battery, two NeoPixel jewels, and a bunch of uh, 12, 12 flora RGB smart NeoPixels. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's a lot of um, potential with cheer squads and wearables because That's true. a lot of wearables, um, you have to try really hard to make them subtle, like they more often than not are very uh, garish and loud. Yep, and yep. that's great for costumes, cosplay stuff, and cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. So um, I saw even some footage recently from a halftime show of the Brooklyn Nets, the basketball team, and their cheerleaders had big letter Bs with LEDs in them on, uh, as backpacks. And they were cheering and turning right. around and LED Bs. It would also be cool if they just had big Bs on their backs. But I've actually never seen uh, Well, if your mascot was a bee, like if you were the, the doesn't North Carolina have a, like a Hornets team of some kind? Yes. Sports team, sports. Yes, they do. I, I'm pretty sure. It occurs to me that I have no idea what sport the University of Dayton Lady Flyers are. It's okay. Don't. Or is that the name of the cheer squad? I think that's probably the cheer I'm, squad. I'm excited about wearable electronics. I don't, can't say I have a lot of domain knowledge about sport ball. True. And you're confusing me focusing on it. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> In any case, you can never, there's no top to breach. There's no ceiling of cheer. You can keep going and uh, I can definitely see LEDs pushing you there. Speaking of LEDs. This whole we are. Yes, um, we are. We do that a lot. It's not that strange. Come on. No. Do it. no, speaking of subtle, subtle and lovely wearable LEDs, mm -hmm. this uh, hat is by Dominique Muris and she works for a uh, Belgian French Hobby shop, web hobby shop called Microcontroller, and Microcontroller Hobby, and uh, likes to work with. Uh, this is made with a Gemma sequin starter pack, mm -hmm. and likes to write about uh, the wearables projects on their blog. So obviously that makes them a native fruit reseller. Super cool. Um, Leslie made a post about it and includes her French quote about this lovely chapeau. Nice, a friendly person, smiling face. Wearable that, electronics. You know all that makes people happy. Yeah, yeah, apparently. Okay, that's all for our Ladies. customer projects this week. Right. This is our we're not done. debut wearables project that Kate Hartman and I worked on last week. Mm -hmm. We're using a muscle sensor on our forehead. Why don't we just show the video? Because it explains everything. Because I've got some like eye language going on here. You can come back to this slide later all if right. you want. I'll do this while I watch the video. Okay. Welcome to another Adafruit wearable electronics project. Today we're using our muscles to send text messages. My special guest is Kate Hartman, who's director of the Social Body Lab at OCAD University and has a lot of experience with electromyography. 
That's the technical term for sensing the electrical activity of our muscles, also known as EMG. It's really neat to use nonverbal communication like facial expressions as an interface for electronics. Today we're going to be using the muscles that raise our eyebrows to say, so. We're using a MyoWare muscle sensor and a Feather Blue Fruit microcontroller to send a signal through the phone up to Adafruit I.O. and then if this then that, which in this case is triggering an SMS. Let's get started. The sensor outputs a signal that can be read by any analog input pin. We're using silicone coated stranded wire to connect up the power, ground and signal pins. Braiding them can make everything a bit tidier. On the Feather, these wires go to power, ground and analog pin zero. Use the sample code provided in the complete tutorial to program your Feather using the Arduino IDE. The link is in the description. Before we put the sensor on our muscles, let's talk about safety for a second. Anytime you hook up an electrical device to your body, you want to take the proper precautions. So if you're going to power this circuit over USB, you need to use a power isolator like this one. Once you're operating on battery power, the isolator is no longer necessary. Snap the electrodes to the three connectors on the sensor. The one closest to the wires should go at the middle of the muscle that you're sensing. The other one should go towards the end of the muscle. The third electrode at the end of the black wire should go somewhere else uh, away from the muscle that you're sensing. It's fun to experiment with different muscle locations, and you can look up anatomy illustrations to figure out which ways the muscles go. Plug in your battery and connect the feather using Adafruit Blue Fruit LE Connect for iOS or Android. Configure your MQTT settings and publish the values to a feed on Adafruit I.O. Create a recipe on If This Then That that checks the feed for new values and then performs an action of your choice. I'd like to text Kate, so. Because it's connected to If This Then That, the possibilities of what you can accomplish by just raising your eyebrows are endless. We thought of a couple other things you could do with this circuit, like book an appointment with your dermatologist when your Botox wears off or get yourself out of a bad date using a butt dial. Get it? If you don't mind setting up a SIM card and doing a little advanced programming, you can send text messages or make phone calls using the Adafruit Phono. We've got some tutorials about that on the Adafruit Learning System. What kinds of network connected muscle sensing projects could you come up with? Let us know your ideas in a comment below. And thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Kate, for being here. Don't forget to subscribe to the Adafruit channel on YouTube for more wearable electronics projects. All right, that was uh, fascinating. Thanks. I, I actually, it gave me an idea, oh, yeah? too. I'm thinking, well, you, see, you see this? Yes. Is that when I get concerned? Yes. This, I figure yeah. I could swell soothing music or perhaps a binaural beat of like a, a calm theta wave. Yeah. It just, it starts to swell up every time. Uh, it would yes. be coming up a lot and going down a lot. Yeah. Though, so, uh, Sounds good. Uh, this, this placement that we used, um, could be used for furrowing or raising, actually. Right, right, okay. So I could even probably, yeah, I wouldn't have to make that many adjustments. Right, but we couldn't tell the difference between furrowing and raising. Okay, how sensitive was this sensor? Um, it was pretty good. I wouldn't be, think you could use it for like uh, like a bunch of very sensitive things. Like right. there's, it can have noise and the like, how long it takes for the values to dip back down might not be as fast as you want. So mm -hmm. it's really good for like, doing a um, like a state change edge detection where like you don't want it to get falsely triggered too many times. So if you take a look at our code, you can see um, very, some very simple, you know, if it's greater than the thing and like, and the previous value was less than the threshold, then okay, yeah. that's what I mean by state change edge, edge detection. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. And it, we found it to be more sensitive over Bluetooth than uh, over the USB connection, actually. So you know how like anytime you change the power supply, your analog readings are going to be all different? Yep, yep. you got to recalibrate, um, basically. So we found that the, the change in values coming in was a lot greater when it was on the, the wireless battery-powered Bluetooth circuit rather than the USB bus powered with the power oscillator um, circuit. So, and actually with our sample code, it's really not that hard to get it um, up and running with the UART connection on the Adafruit Blue Fruit LE Connect app. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, like Kate wrote two guides. She wrote the, the guide for the brow project and then she wrote a getting started with the muscle sensor guide that uses the 
Feather 32U4 basic proto and debugs the analog values over USB through the power isolator. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's, it, and that's great if that's like your first electronics project, but if you've done any Arduino projects before, I don't think it's really um, that much harder to go straight to the Bluetooth one. And we found such a wider range of values um, coming in in the, um, the UART like port communication. So, um, because of the different power supply. So right. um, I would say jump straight to that if you're interested in, if you have any experience and you're interested in doing any muscle sensing projects. Um, we had a great time. It was really Many fun possibilities with this, yeah. I'm kind of swimming in different ideas. Mm -hmm. Huh. Okay, well, I'll get back to you with some others. Okay. Until then. <laughs> if you'd like to purchase any muscle sensing uh, hardware or any other hardware that's in stock, um, excluding gift certificates and software, you can use discount code MILLION for 10% off your entire order up until 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. Sounds good. How about we uh, go swing by the uh, Project Workshop? Project Workshop, Project Workshop. That's the theme song. <laughs> in today's Project Workshop, Binko writes, okay, it's not quite a wearable, but it's textile. I'm thinking about making a stuffed fabric cube that detects its orientation and broadcasts that. You can think of it as a stuffed die, although it won't have dots, just six colors. Size will be about 8 to 12 inches per edge. Honestly, if it works, I'll want more than one size. I can handle the electronics, I think, 9 off to BLE feather with battery. My questions are about the sewing and how to place the electronics within the cube. I'm expecting the enclosure to be Altoid size, maybe a bit bigger depending on the battery choice. I need it to be protected from the blunt trauma, there are kids involved here, and yet remain oriented correctly with respect to the cube. That is, its axes should align with the cube. I expect to calibrate it when I place the enclosure in the cube and then always start it with red up, if you follow. I'd like to either add an inductive charging circuit, a stretch, or just a zipper pocket where I can turn off the electronics and swap batteries. So here's the questions. Should I be worried about heat? I don't think a simple circuit would overheat, but are there any stuffings I should avoid? How would you secure the enclosure to a side while protecting it? I'm thinking some type of pocket sewn into the side with stuffing between the enclosure and the side. Have you seen anything like this? What did Teddy Ruxpin do? A question I ask very often myself. Would I be better off with a box in the center and padding all around or stuffing it full? This won't be a stuffed animal or a chair, but may have children's weight on it. Any pointers would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, Bill. Okay, so okay, Bill. what Bill's talking about building. Pretty similar. <laughs> right. Um, if just to get us it, to get us all on the same page. He said he's confident in building the electronics. The electronics he's talking about is a, um, an orientation detecting uh, circuit very similar to what we've got going on in right. the 3D printed talking D20. Mm -hmm. It uses very, the nine off, similar. which is called with nine degrees of freedom sensor, that you, where you can get your absolute orientation um, from all of the different sensors on board there. So that's great. I'm glad that you are confident in building that because I certainly wouldn't be without knowing Pedro and Philby's guide on that. Um, but now that we're all on the same page, you've come to the right place with your questions about mm -hmm. the crafting part of this. Cubes. So cubes. Um, plush cubes, generally, if you look online on like Instructables or these other places, puffy. you see like boop, puffy mm -hmm. plush cubes and it's because you stuff it with, fill it with fiber fill and that fiber fill just is compressed. It doesn't have like a shape really mm -hmm. and it's just pushing against the, out, the outer membrane. Wants to be a sphere. Membrane, basically. wants yeah. to be a sphere. And so um, what, I really and what I really would recommend for you is upholstery foam. And you, I know you said it's not for sitting, but um, upholstery foam. The foam, foam uh, the form really well. Yeah. yeah, upholstery foam has a natural shape. You can cut it with a, an electric uh, a turkey knife. Oh, and that's what you do? Yeah, that's a, I swear that's the official huh. tool they usually use at the, some form of an electric bread knife, bread or turkey knife. And um, the foam then can be, uh, you can like either, you can find one of these at like Ikea or something, or you can go to your mm. local upholstery place and have them cut you some foam, or you can also cut your foam yourself. And then um, you could either like cut your cube in half and like open it up like a sandwich. Dig out a center hole. Yeah, and then close it back up. Or just have a slot, right? But you could cut like a, like a hole in one side that goes to a, like an igloo, like with mm -hmm. an opening in the inside um, that you could maybe reach your hand inside or um, similar. I think cutting in half sounds good, yeah. Or you could um, you could dig a channel, pluck out that middle part, cut off part of it, and then put it back so that it like a like a bung mm -hmm. in a in a boat. Mm -hmm. 
And um, anyway, Plug. <laughs> you yeah. could get your different shapes that way. Um, however, if you wanted to go the plush uh, polyfill route, you could totally do that too. And I would highly recommend you take apart at least one electronic kids toy. Mm -hmm. um, here is, in fact, a picture of the very first teardown I ever did. This is in college, like 10, or, 10 or so years ago, where we were building plush toys, but first we were assigned to take apart a commercial plush toy and learn about all of the really interesting design that considerations. That is a robust enclosure. Yeah. yeah, so the enclosures inside kids' toys, you'll notice are like all really heavy duty injection molded plastic with screws on the battery compartment so that kids can't accidentally get the batteries out. And then uh, you'll see this one has like a, a sort of milk jug like bottle top mm -hmm. shaped opening for the wires to come out. And that's because right. there was like a fabric sleeve that went over the wires and the fabric sleeve zip tied to the top of the enclosure. That it's way when there was really pressure on the uh, enclosure, it pulled between the fabric and the plastic, not the wires. Mm -hmm. um, so that's important for preventing short circuits because um, yeah, the, the likelihood of a short with your live poly battery um, inside of something like this is increased the you know, if you don't take precautions for the strain relief. Um, there's one more picture from this. Right, right. Where um, other elements, so like you, you obviously you're not gonna injection mold your enclosure, but you may design and 3D print one that's based on the design of injection molded enclosures. You could also get a toy, take it apart, and reuse the electronics enclosure that came inside that toy. And you can like carve out some of the custom shaping like with a Dremel inside. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the other parts, uh, like you can see the speaker in this toy, other parts that um, are already in a plastic shell that don't have batteries inside them so they don't need to be super rigid, um, are th they keep the fiber fill out of them by just making a very lightweight fabric pouch, Casing. kind of like you yeah. described. Um, and then as far as keeping it oriented in the cube, you're going to have to do some tethers to the um, seams. Yeah, and if you that. do enough tethers, let's just like a crocheted string or a piece of not stretchy fabric that um, like suspends it inside the middle of the cube. Okay, suspending the enclosure inside yeah. the middle of the cube, okay. And maybe even with some more fabric pieces and then you have multiple pockets that you fill with the right. fiber fill. I guess I my first, I would just try to make it fit very tightly inside the foam. But yeah, but then if you smush it or lean on it, then when it, it comes back, it's, right. it's going to twist and the orientation is not going to be the you same. made fit stabilizing fins. Anyway, there's yeah, a lot of Yeah, it does need stabilizing fins. So, I mean, I think that the upholstery foam uh, method is going to really be what you want. Um, let's move on to talking about the charging, right. shall we? Um, this, I think, is a little overkill for your project. So this is the, the key charging um, or chi charging membrane um, receiver that mm -hmm. you would put in your circuit, but it's very flexible and therefore kind of fragile in terms of putting it very close to the edge of your um, plush toy because it has to be very, very close to the transmitter in order to to actually charge mm -hmm. and at any at its maximum efficiency rate, which is only like 40% anyway. Right. So my recommendation to you would be instead of trying the inductive charging route, have a little pocket for a charging cable that comes out and then you, you like Velcro it open, you pull it out, you plug it in, you take it out and, or, or just like, you know, a pocket where you can reach the USB port on the feather yeah. um, rather than trying to do inductive charging. Zipper and just go into that seam. Or However, or alkaline batteries are the industry standard still for safety for kids toys. Um, I haven't seen too many live poly rechargeable kids toys um, just because the batteries do have an increased risk of um, bulging and chemicals and all that stuff um, right. if they're not protected super, super well. So I would take a look at what modern toys are doing because, you know, they're made by giant companies that want to lower their liability risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, They've done the homework for yeah. you can benefit from that. Right. Um, cool. And then if you want to look, but if you want to look at a project that um, uses inductive charging at kind of, I would say, the limit of uh, the flexibility of an inductive charging circuit, you could look at our um, cell phone charging purse because right. that puts one of the coils on a hard shelf and then the other one in the bottom of a flat bag. And the bag, that's always, it's not being like mushed and moved around inside the bag. Cool, that, that about covers it. Cool, that'll be a fun project. Yeah, I mean, definitely share it with us. It sounds pretty cool and interesting, like a fun challenge, especially if you already have got the engineering chops to do the orientation mm -hmm. circuitry. Um, putting it inside a toy like that sounds really rewarding and fun. But as usual, just be like extra super careful about anything that you're giving to kids. Um, always use it with them supervised um, because you're, you're not a team of toy designers who thinks of every possible thing that could happen. True. So. I keep flashing back, I keep seeing glowing plush meat. 
Was yeah. that you? Yeah, I made that. Did you make that? Yeah, I made that. Okay. In that same class where I did that teardown. That must have been what, how I, yep. Yeah, it's a pretty good class. Right, you can look it up. College. What was that called? What did you call it? That class was called Making well, Wireless the, the Toys. Meat, the meat. Oh, the... plush irradiated sirloin. It was my first article for Make Magazine. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Our today's discount code being million. If you'd like to buy any supplies to make your own orientation sensing plush toy or other electronics projects, you can get 10% off your whole order, everything except gift certificates and software, and that expires tonight at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. And you can pick up components, some like our component of the week, which is actually not available yet. No, our component of the week isn't coming yet. soon. This is Circuit Playground, um, and it is a really fun coming soon learning circuit. It looks very much like Flora, and indeed, it does also have a 32U4 microcontroller but it on is board. Jam packed. It's got a whole lot going on. Yes, it has some additional things on it too, including 10 mini NeoPixels, one LIS 3DH triple axis accelerometer, a temperature sensor, a light sensor, a sa uh, sound sensor, aka a microphone, a mini speaker in the form of a magnetic buzzer, two push buttons, on the one on the left and one on the right, and a slide switch, and eight alligator, alligator friendly clips for attaching to the pins that are exposed, which allow you to attach I squared C devices, UART connected devices, and four pins that can do analog inputs and PWM output. And all eight pads can be capacitive touch sensors. So that makes it basically capable of accomplishing like half of our repertoire of 150 wearables tutorial. Pretty much, yeah. And it requires no soldering. So if you're running like a workshop, um, or class, and you can't have soldering irons in your class. Excellent board to learn on, yeah. Yes, so um, the reason we're talking about it now is because it's it's coming very soon, and if you are interested in getting it when it comes out, you should sign up on the product page to be notified when it comes out. That's your best chance to get it as soon as it comes out, because I have a feeling the first batch should sell out pretty quickly. Um, you, could, you could basically like skip the breadboard for the first few lessons. Yes, that's exactly that what it's designed for. It's, designed, it's specifically designed so that you don't have to learn about the breadboard. You can just learn about what the sensor does and how to program it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it has some LEDs on it already, so it's really naturally, like, easy to put a pin back on and wear it like a brooch or um, hat nice. adornment. Uh, it's going to be great. Great for classes. You can't get, you can't use the discount code with coming soon products, but if you'd like to get anything else that's in stock, Use code MILLION in celebration of our one millionth order. 10% off your whole order, excluding gift certificates and software. Time for questions and answers. We'll be featuring both. <laughs> and if you ask a question that we choose, that we answer and then choose, and you will receive a prize. And right now, that's going to be the excellent book, Getting Started with Adafruit Flora, by Becky Stern and Tyler Cooper. Let's get right to it, shall we? Yes, please. Our first question from Dan and Alexander is, hey, Becky, I'm making an outfit for my daughter for her dance class, and I want to get some input about wearable power supplies. I know that LiPo batteries, uh, LiPo batteries run a high risk of fire, well, a risk of fire, perhaps, but, and obviously not an option, but what about the cylinder batteries that come in stuff like product ID 1959? It comes in the plastic casing and whatnot. How safe are they? Do you think that something like that would be a safe option to power my six-year-old's outfit? It'll be powering a five-volt trinket and about 20 dot stars split into two rows of 10, running at about 50% or so brightness. What do you think the best and safest wearable, preferably rechargeable, power supply would be for her? Well, first, just to say, it's not a high risk of fire for live batteries. No, it's not. It's a, it's a low risk, but it is a, it is a it kind is of- It is a risk. It is yeah. a high yeah. consequence risk. And so that's right. why we mention it frequently when people propose projects with live poly batteries on their pets or their mm -hmm. kids, because um, the risk is there, and if it happens, it's really bad. Of course. Um, but it's, I wouldn't say it's a high risk of fire. I've never set a project on fire with a live poly battery. I've never set a project on fire. Nor have I. Right. And um, I've heard very few accounts of live poly batteries actually catching on fire, especially in projects when you're being so con you're so conscientious. Anyway, right. I, it, you're right though that the bending and flexing of them in a dance um, costume it's not yeah, you it's not be ideal. Extra careful, sure, sure. Right. So, um, however, like have you seen you know pop stars perform with like the the 
wireless transmitters like on their clipped onto like their bra or the back of their dress. Mm -hmm. um, like that's a pretty safe spot to put Li Poly batteries. And if you wanted to protect them with a 3D printed enclosure, which we have some of for different size, that's um, a to take. Yeah, you can um, print it in semi-flex, and that'll prevent a lot of the um, like. If you were to roll on it, it wouldn't bend the battery, right. etc. Um, however, uh, these are a perfectly fine option. We have a couple of different styles of these hard shell. They are also Li Poly, yeah, or Li, Li Ion yeah. packs. Um, they're very sturdy. We have them in this this blue one. We have two flat um, white ones. Usually, we, we have them in the store mainly for Raspberry Pi because they're five volt USB power mm -hmm. supplies. But they're also great for recharging your cell phone and running your wearables projects. If you look at the um, the light bandolier, three D printed light bandolier, we used one of these to power that because it's like a lot of NeoPixels mm -hmm. on very bright. Um, my only problem with these is that sometimes they have, depending on which one you're using, they have a, a low voltage um, cutout. So. If you have a circuit that's activated by a sensor and say the LEDs aren't always on, it it's like it might shut off okay. because the power's not the, the circuit's not drawing enough power to um, keep the USB pack on because right. it has some circuitry in there to automatically shut it off if you like unplug your phone right. or whatever. Um, because they're primarily designed for charging, it's expecting you to have a, a current draw above above a certain amount. So, um, right. but if your LEDs are constantly on, um, might not be a problem for you. And um, I find them very handy for uh, times when you want your when you have pockets and you want your wearable uh, electronics project to last a really long time. All right. Okay. Cool. So that's a path to take. Mm -hmm. Alice writes, Dear Miss Becky, I wanted to make a scaled down version of the Pixie Fiber Optic Skirt. So I was wondering if there were any a specific code power requirements for just one Pixie. Can I use the unicorn horn code and a Gemma to control it? Okay, so the Pixie does use more. Yeah, the power. Pixie is, and it uses a Did different it? library than the NeoPixels. Right. Um, however, the uh, built in functions are very, very similar. So uh, you should be able to easily adapt the unicorn horn code. Sort of provided a you, replace, yeah. yeah, you have to like sub substitute out the library call for the NeoPixel library to the Pixie library. Um, but you could also just simplify the sketch Erin used for her thing to take out the sensor stuff, if, if that, that could be one route as well. Um, the other thing, the power, so that's the code. The power requirement, um, the Pixies are three watt LEDs, so at five volts they'll draw like six, we calculated like 600 milliamps mm -hmm. or so. Um, so that just means that you need a battery pack that can provide that much power at once. So you can't use a battery that's, if you're going to have it on full brightness, you can't have a battery that's less than 600 milliamp, milliamp hours mm -hmm. um, because it could pull that much power at once. Um, but if you have it on like half brightness, you could probably get away with the 500 milliamp hour battery, but it probably won't last that long. So I would recommend like the, is it like a 12 or 1300 milliamp hour battery? 1200. We have? The 1200, the right? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like we have a 12 and we have a 25. Yeah. And then we have a, a more. It's just using a 12. Yep. Um, yeah, and then a Gemma should be fine. Hmm. Okay, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Fiona Leg writes, hello, I'm an artist in Canada working in textiles, and I wanted to add LED sequins to my next project. The idea is to have about 30 sequins arranged in a pattern on a pair of pants. I want the viewer to be able to press a button on the wall, which would wirelessly turn on the lights for about a minute. I understand that it is also possible to make the lights fade, which is an option. My question is, how do I accomplish this? Do I use a flora? And what kind of switch do I use? And where can I get it? I have the sequins and thread now and realize that I need a bigger battery pack than I had, but I don't know what other products would best help me reach my objective. Any input is welcome. Thanks, Fiona. Okay. So 30, 30 sequins is a bunch for conductive thread. If you have any trouble mm -hmm. with it, you might want to switch to silicone coated stranded wire. Um, especially if you plan to like sweat in your pants. But anyway, um, okay. I would highly encourage you, so I'm assuming you're doing this in a gallery, and so you're gonna be a one part of the gallery, and then you're gonna have visitors of the gallery be able to touch the button and activate the LEDs. Um, and so uh, while Bluetooth or like a 315 megahertz like wireless transmitter receiver module could be used in this scenario, I think that your most robust and bang for your buck option is gonna be Wi-Fi, and um, which has been recently made a lot easier with the Huzzah module and Adafruit IO. So check out this tutorial about a remote control using two Huzzahs and 
um, Adafruit I.O. And uh, if your gallery has nice Wi-Fi all over, that means that it doesn't matter where the button is compared to right. you, as long as you're both connected to the same Wi-Fi network. Taking advantage of the usually relatively strong Wi-Fi networks around us. Yeah. yeah, or even if they were on different, it would work also like around the globe if you're as long as they were configured to their respective wireless network. Mm -hmm. So it's actually really flexible. And I, I swear it's a lot easier than it might seem. Um, a lot of my students last semester at SVA did internet connected projects with Huzzah and they had no prior electronics experience before like their intro to Arduino we yeah, did For some reason class. Wi-Fi seems like it might be kind of really high end and intimidating. But our sample code, you just put in the SSID and the password and like it kind of does the rest for right. you. So um, yeah, all my students had a really easy time, like surprisingly so. Um, so I think that Wi-Fi, Internet of Things, uh, DIY stuff is in a really good spot with Adafruit I/O and the um, the ESP module. It's just it's just never been never been easier. Back Don't in my be day, use it to your advantage. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why? For what? I'm going to connect to the. Oh, I need like Ethernet stack or yeah. And so to be clear, that is a that is its own um, microcontroller that you install like a custom board, like any of the other custom boards in your Arduino Android IDE. IDE yeah. Requires a few more fiddly uh, configuration in the like. Board setup, but I like just read we'll the guide. Be on that it'll straight yeah, forward. yeah, yeah. We'll walk you straight through it. So okay. good luck. Let us know how it goes. Okay, um, those fine question askers. Also, today's project workshop question asker are in the eyeball bowler. Colin, please pick a winner. I will not use any eyeball to pick a winner. I will use hand, which can't see a thing. But now I'll look and I'll tell you. Alice Sato. Oh, right. Congratulations. Alice, I know you probably already have one of these books, so you can give it to a friend of yours. Please email, email support at adafruit.com to claim your prize. And uh, if you didn't win, that's OK. You can still get 10% off your whole order. You're all winners in my book. The code is million today for 10% off your whole order, excluding gift certificates and software, expires 11.59 PM tonight. So true, Ms. Stern. Just a quick reminder, subscribe to our newsletters on adafruitdaily.com to get a daily wearables tip in your inbox or biohacking, 3D printing, maker business, general electronics tips. Everything? We yeah, got newsletters coming out of our ears. Covered. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at Avondale Dodge. We've got you covered in the tips department. But we won't spam you or, and it's not related to your shopping account, so they're completely separate. No relation. Yeah, all good. Um, if you haven't had enough, which Let's be honest, how could you possibly? Make it enough. Come to Show and Tell tonight at 7.30, uh, where uh, people like you come and show off their projects. You can sign up for that by RSVPing on the Google Plus event. And then stick around at 8 o'clock for Ask an Engineer with Mr. and Mrs. Lady Ada. New products and more. Tomorrow, it's Noe and Pedro with 3D Hangouts and a new debut 3D printing project. They talk shop, answer questions, CAD tutorials. Generally. A little bit of wearables mixed in there, because, you know, there's an overlap. It's true. The Venn diagrams extend. Colin, it's nice to have you on the show. It's been a little while. Thank it's you. It's always great to be here. Glad to be back. Good to see you, Becky. You too. You guys too. Thanks for watching. We'll be back again next week, or at least I will. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel on YouTube so you can be notified when the live broadcasts are happening. Bye.